Uh, absolutely. First of all, Justin and Gene, thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts. Good to be here. Um, I run the analytics slash decision sciences function at Citibank on the consumer side. And we measure success really on three dimensions. Dimension number one is delivering material alpha commercial outcomes. Dimension number two is collaborating with the lines of business to tackle specific strategic problems through the lens of advanced analytics. And dimension number three is this notion of democratizing intelligence. Not democratizing data, but democratizing intelligence. Makes sense. And our topic today <clears throat> is intended to be provocative. Is your data strategy detrimental to your team? I think very often when we talk about big data analytics, uh, we think very much about the technologies at play. But there's always a people dimension that's really important as well. And so I'm curious, Merle, you know, what do people in data roles get wrong from your perspective? Gosh, um, three things. Number one is uh, people tend to be focused on being reactive, i.e. responding to questions that someone else is asking versus shaping the question. The second area where we tend to foot fault as data professionals is an excessive focus on infrastructure at the expense of understanding what that infrastructure will drive and taking accountability for it. And the challenge number three that I see is a focus on uh, proofs of concepts and pilots mm. without having a blueprint around what you want to accomplish, how you measure success, when, and how do you bring the rest of the organization along to orchestrate that change? Because if you get this right, at the end of the day, you're re-architecting what decisions are made and how decisions are made. There are people at the other end of that. And so being able to think of it holistically versus the task of delivering a set of insights, to me, is profoundly different. Makes sense. And can you give me maybe some examples where you've seen this create challenges for organizations, and what is that negative impact? Yes, um, the, the negative impact can oftentimes be very simply, you're re-architecting roles. Mm. You're not just delivering a set of insights, you're not just delivering a tool or a platform, you're re-architecting how decisions are made. I'll give you one example of that within the context of Citi. Imagine we spend X billions of dollars on marketing, and the question is, how do you know you're achieving the biggest bang for your buck? We built an in-house software tool that we call Marginal Return on Investment. And it answers the question, how do you toggle uh, earnings mm -hmm. with return on equity? How do you toggle short-term goals of account growth with a net present value of EBIT? And when you make those kinds of trade-offs and when you illuminate those choices, you're naturally taking money from one place and investing it differently in another, that creates a little bit of friction in the system. And so the question is to be thinking about holistically, when you build a software solution like that that guides the decisions, don't just think of it as a tool, understand the process end to end through the lens of a CEO and CFO and head of audit and take responsibility if not accountability for orchestrating that change. Makes sense. Now, one of the things you also mentioned there is the tendency towards a reactionary mindset. Yeah. And I know one thing you're passionate about is creating a culture of curiosity within your teams. So how do you flip that mindset from being reactionary to truly being curious and proactive? Goodness, um, no, no easy answers. I don't think you can flip someone's mindset from reactionary to being proactive. However, you can create a fertile ground to stoke a greater culture of curiosity. I'll give you one example of something that we're working on as we speak, it's work in progress, is when you think about business intelligence in a very traditional way, it's been very hypothesis driven. First there was the world of Excel spreadsheets, now we're in the world of tableaus with automated alerts, but the real challenge is you've got data coming in on a day in, day out, minute by nanosecond basis. How do you understand anomalies in the data that point to issues or opportunities that you might not have had a human hypothesis for? Yep. So our thesis is that we're gonna build this brain that we call an anomaly detection engine with the intention of understanding any changes and patterns without having to depend on human intuition. 
Mm -hmm. So we see that as a catalyst for asking more questions and as an enabler to reducing that friction from where curiosity meets data, insight, and decision. And that's why I feel very strongly about this notion of democratization of intelligence, which is to me distinctly different from democratization of data. Data unto itself is, is, is raw materials. It has some meaning, but it only has meaning when it's put into context and when it's guiding insights and decisions. And thinking through that life cycle and reducing the friction in that is, is where I see a, a phenomenal opportunity for all of us as data professionals. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I, I think that the, a lot of those concepts uh, apply to, frankly, any role, you know, as you have maybe a, a junior team member who does what you tell them to do, but graduating to being proactive uh, and, and naturally trying to answer maybe the questions that you haven't asked yeah. is, a, is a great sign of maturity, I think, in, in any individual and in any data team. Do you have advice for maybe any of the data leaders out here in the audience for how to coach and develop that within within people? How, how have you seen that you know play out successfully that that transition? Goodness, again, no easy answers to this, Justin. Um, my first thought is think of yourselves as leaders first. Pretend that that word data did not exist for a moment. The world is obviously moving at an unprecedented pace of data-driven intelligence and decision-making. There's no doubt about that, right? However, being adding that word data sort of naturally, in my view, puts a little bit of a sense of blinders or uh, makes, uh, makes our identity more narrow than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And my thought is the key is to stoke a culture of curiosity. And the way you do that, I think, is by challenging junior analysts to not just think of tasks, but think about the meaning behind the task and the context within which those insights will lead to decisions and outcomes. And the phrase that we use in my team quite a bit is this notion of zooming in and zooming out. I think of it a little bit like a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. If you are playing with one piece alone, there's no way that you could actually put that puzzle together because you're seeing just that one piece without understanding the total context of where that piece could possibly fit in. And so the key for me in being effective is this ability to see the big picture, being able to step back, and then being able to go into the details and drawing those connections consistently. And, and the challenge that I throw out to my team is, can you teach yourself the skill to think like a CEO? Mm -hmm. to think like a CFO, what matters to them? Why does it matter to them? And how do you communicate in language and context that is relevant to them? More often than not, my team, like many of our teams, I think is focused on informing through analysis and insights. And what I've challenged them to think through is informing is a necessary step, but it's not the be all end all. Your ultimate goal is influencing. Influencing decisions and influencing outcomes. How do you make the leap from informing as a very baseline capability to recognizing that your true north is in actually influencing decisions and outcomes? And that to me is the true power of AI, machine learning, and whatever moniker that we give it at any point in time. Yeah, that's great. I think that's great advice, uh, that idea of think like a CEO. It's something we actually tell many of our own folks at Starburst, this idea of ownership is one of our cultural values. And we tell even our, our account executives, like you are the CEO of the territory that you operate in. You know, think about that holistically, be proactive in solving problems. So I think that's, that's great advice. Um, touching on AI, which you just briefly mentioned, and no panel would be complete without talking about AI to some degree. I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, from your vantage point, how can organizations make the leap from focusing on AI as a functional thing to a decision science that has measurable impacts on customers and society, right? It feels like we're somewhere in this hype curve, uh, yeah. if, you, if you follow the Gartner hype curve as, a, as an example. And, you know, how do we get to that, um, you know, that, um, that uh, plateau productivity, I think they call it at the end, when, when you're actually getting real value? Gosh, um, so first and foremost, 
let's not think of AI as a tool or a capability because then you get into the mindset of I've got the tool or capability, what am I gonna use it for? And that's where, for me, I'm mildly allergic, hopefully not su supremely allergic to the phrase use case because it's got this sort of sense of I'm gonna dip my toes and see what happens and think about it. The way I would frame it is set aside the power of AI slash generative AI, at least recognize the power, but set it aside for a moment and think about what are the decisions and processes and workflows you'd want to be able to re-architect end to end, and then how can AI be in service of that problem statement or that opportunity based statement. To start with the process or the issue, and the framework that I've used oftentimes in my team is, is a certain coverage manual? Is it partial? Does, is there a significant out of pocket cost associated with it? Does making mistakes have either regulatory or customer impact? And do we have data exhaust that is essentially going to waste and not being tapped into? And just by using that simple framework and recognizing that there's plenty of people in all of our firms that do highly me mechanized decisions using manual interpretation of data that is repeated and that doesn't actually have a new level of intelligence that you could actually automate through cheaper, faster, infinitely more sophisticated solutions of AI and really kind of drawing that connection of what are the 10, 12 problems that you think you could solve that might move the needle of the EBIT or the return on equity for your firm in a material way that is visible to the external world. And by the way, they are in front of you. You just have to sort of conceptualize them and work your way into what tools or methodologies you want to be able to use in service of that and how do you orchestrate that end-to-end um, -end, uh, change. And that's tough because it's a whole lot easier to talk about do I choose Snowflake or do I choose Databricks or XYZ? Yep. That's a very concrete decision. Yep. Um, and so the, the, the discussion of tools and you know, do I like uh, ChatGPT or Llama and so on and so forth, it's not that those aren't important questions, but that's a little bit like saying, should I wear brown shoes or black shoes to work today? Yes, it sort of matters, but not really. Mm -hmm. The bigger question is being able to conceptualize to be able to reimagine critical aspects of core operations in a way that you could re-architect and then work your way back to the tools and uh, methodologies that you'd want to be able to use and the people orchestration and the change that you'd want to be able to, uh, you'd want to be able to sort of stoke in the organization. That conceptual thinking is significantly harder than saying, I've chosen my cloud provider and I know what tools we're gonna have in our toolkit. And I think that the world gravitates toward that because it's more concrete and it's more self-evident and it's a much more comfortable conversation versus being able to delve into the world of abstract and being able to reimagine what you'd want to solve for. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Maybe building on that, uh, you know, you, you mentioned earlier sort of one of your, uh, I'll call it pet peeves, is maybe, um, obsession with pilots without having a blueprint, like doing POCs just for a POC's sake. Yeah. Um, what does a blueprint for success look like? Like what does good look like from your standpoint to make sure that you know, we're focusing on outcome uh, beyond just that infrastructure and tools themselves as, as you described? My view is we identify a portfolio of opportunity statements that are material, You've got a clear sense of what success looks like 12, 18, 24 months down the road. And you've got a vision for how that process needs to be re-architected end to end. And then you, you work your way toward the technical solution. So for example, let's say that I get N number of calls today and I've got a team of people manually listening to calls, trying to adjudicate is this a complaint? What sort of a complaint is it? Mm -hmm. You take that problem, that, that sort of observation of a process that probably exists in most major institutions, most certainly most legacy major institutions. The thing about it is you've got people involved, so you've got a huge out-of-pocket cost. 
The process is very manual because they're listening to calls and they're making heuristics or subjective decisions on categorization of those calls. When you make mistakes in the context of financial services, but many other industries, there are implications from a regulatory and customer friction standpoint. You've got data exhaust, which is the conversation that you're having with the customer, the transcript, and everything else that preceded that, because you know all of the interactions that happen before that act call actually happened. You know the customer journey prior to that call happening. And the question is very simply, if you were to re-architect this process, how much cost would it take out of the system? What error reduction would you have? And oh, by the way, could you use this as an opportunity to create more uh, democratization of the intelligence of what is happening with those customer interactions in a way such that if you were the chief marketing officer, you'd get a particular lens. If you were the head of uh, uh, compliance, you'd get a different lens. Every functional area could actually get a bespoke view that allows them to engage in that content and get the pulse of the customers on a daily or a near real-time basis. So you're solving for vastly superior risk and control. You're taking massive cost out of the process. You are reducing errors and you're democratizing the knowledge and the intelligence that people need to have from that in a way that mitigates that friction between something happened, did I know about it, did I act upon it, and, and what was the uh, adverse outcome that I uh, prevented perhaps. Yeah, makes sense. So have a clear blueprint before you do a POC or, or pilot. Uh, by the way, from a vendor perspective, uh, we would wholeheartedly agree with you because it's not just wasting your team's time, it's potentially wasting yeah. our own time, you know, partnering with you on, on uh, you know, POCs that don't have a purpose to them. We, we like to call them proof of value to really just focus, you know, on, on the business value. So once you've established that blueprint, how do you measure success? Uh, for me, um, it is, there's a financial metric associated with a very specifically defined either expense takeout or cost avoidance or revenue driven EBIT if, it, if that were the case. And the discipline in collaboration with multiple functions including finance of tracking that. There's a metric of um, people's engagement with the platform and usage and a measure of how are you reducing that friction time between something happened and did people know about it and did they act upon it. Um, and then there are metrics around errors in the system, whether it's false positive or false negatives or regulatory risk and control breaks and things of that nature. Having metrics around all of that so that you have a very co a clear and common understanding with different functional partners on what the why is and how you know whether you've achieved uh, a level of success. Too often, you see uh, different uh, functional leaders take a pure functional lens of saying, I delivered something, mm -hmm. and now I can run my victory lap. And uh, I use that uh, phrase half jokingly with my team is, hold on to your victory laps, because success is through this lens of not just delivering a capability or a solution, success is seen through the prism of what decisions have you orchestrated through science how did that matter and how are you measuring that through the lens of a CEO, CFO, and head of audit? Why do I say those three areas? CEO is, you'll appreciate this, materiality. Mm -hmm. CFO is when and how is it hitting the financials, not just as stated by you, but as agreed upon with a myriad of functional partners. And head of audit is this notion of attribution and traceability particularly when your metrics are non-financial, mm -hmm. that allows you to say this thing was successful and we know it was successful because we measure it even when the measurement is not fin financial in a pure sense. That's great. CEO, CFO, audit. Got it. Um, for the last question here, we'll get maybe a little philosophical. You know, as generative AI and other innovations in the data space take shape, how are you thinking from a strategic perspective about a sustainable model that incorporates the evolving intersection of human and machine and the you know, respective roles that they each play? I mean, truth be told, we're all as a society figuring our way out. Mm -hmm. um, 
for me, it, it's a, uh, it's a, I have a clear perspective on the fact that anything that people do, the parts of our jobs that are highly mechanized and repeated, that require us to make subjective interpretations based on data, that's going to go away. Yeah. Plain and simple in my view. It's a matter of when, it's not a matter of if. So the role of the human for me is all about bringing that next level intelligence because what can the machines do? They can process data, they can synthesize data, they can summarize data, they can deliver that in conversational intelligence, much cheaper, much faster, much better. So yes, they can actually tell you what happened in the past and they might be able to tell you why. What machines are never going to be able to do is ask the questions that shape the future. Machines are never going to be able to bring that intersectionality, that interdisciplinary thinking and curiosity that allows you to reimagine what the future should look like, harnessing the power of data intelligence. So to me, the, 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 the bar on human intelligence and the level of creativity and the level of uh, cross-functional and cross-discipline thinking that we need to bring as humans is just going to go up, which means that there are very many people who will be at the risk of being left out of that game because they're not learning to adapt. The leap from, in my view, from an agrarian society to an industrial age, while it was inconvenient, wasn't as big because you could teach people to be factory workers. Mm -hmm. Then we have the leap from the uh, industrial age, in my view, to the information age, where you had India and China and many countries in the developing world really kind of grow because we were able to bring that sort of large scale programming and you know a, a baseline coding type talent. Now the leap from an information age to an intelligence age to me is going to be a whole new chasm that'll be on a different level than what we've seen historically as humankind. And those who can adapt are gonna thrive. Uh, those who can't are gonna probably frankly fall into that canyon and that gap between the haves and the have-nots I think is going to get wider than ever before. Indeed, uh, wild times ahead, exciting, scary, all of the above, uh, but thank you Merle very much, it's been a pleasure.